Good evening and welcome to Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, your place for a fun conversation about horror movies. Tonight, we talk about a movie that takes a haunted attraction and transforms the scares into something real. We'll talk about that film, plus we'll talk about a trio of mostly disappointing films in other stuff I watched this week. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're glad to have you here. Now pour yourself a drink and sit back, because here we go. that has caused some controversy in recent weeks drawing from local urban legends. One maze is actually based on Daniel Dyer's mass suicide 10 years ago. Is this in poor taste or just good old fashioned spooky fun? Either way, fun starts tonight at 9 p.m. Back to you, Dak. Uh, before we get started, um, has anyone warned you about this place? I don't scare easily, Mr. Kane, but thank you for your concern. Uh, well, miss, uh, there are people here that even God is afraid of. Let's give the boys a tour of their new playground. I mean, do you really believe that out of the millions of people in this country, there are more than just a handful of sickos? Hmm? I mean, Dahmer and Bundy and Gacy. They're just the ones that got all the press. Here, we house the ones that you whisper about around the campfire. should definitely uh, split up and uh, go look for her. Yeah, especially if there's some candy apples on the way. I always thought a fear of clowns was just subverting what used to be a happy childhood memory. Although this clown is pretty scared. Gear up. We're going to Statesville. It is time for our featured film review. Tonight we are talking about a film called The Fun House Massacre. Yes, The Fun House Massacre is a horror comedy that was released in the year 2015, directed by Andy Palmer, and the cast includes Robert England, Jerry Burns, Scotty Thompson, and a host of others. There's a very large cast in this film. Let's get into what to expect if you're going to watch The Fun House Massacre. If you sit down to watch The Fun House Massacre, what you should expect is a pretty run-of-the-mill horror comedy with an explosive body count. If you enjoyed Friday the 13th, you'll probably enjoy The Fun House Massacre. If you enjoyed a film called The Night Watchman that we reviewed a few seasons back, you'll probably enjoy The, Night, the Fun House Massacre. Let's get into setting our expectations for this film. This is the scale we like to use. On the far left side of the scale, we have very campy films such as Jason X. On the far right side of the scale, we have very serious films such as The Silence of the Lambs. As always, this scale is not intended to indicate the quality of the film. It is indicated to show what your mindset needs to be going into the film if you're going to enjoy it. The Funhouse Massacre is a horror comedy. You pretty much need to be over to the campy side of the spectrum if you're going to enjoy this one. It is not a serious film. It doesn't intend to be serious. Not intended to be taken seriously. 
Now, before we go any farther, we need to get into our vocabulary lesson for this film. Our vocabulary lesson, of course, is the part of the show where we discuss new and innovative words and phrases in an effort to stay ahead of social media bots and algorithms that would otherwise try to ban our conversation. The social media bots and algorithms are always getting smarter, so our conversation must evolve to stay ahead of them. Two terms this week. Our first term, smoosh noodling. Smoosh noodling is the action of flattening, bursting, or squishing a character's noggin through the sudden application of a large mass or blunt object. Colloquial, let's try that again. Colloquial forms of this include melanclonking and gallagering. Our second term is noggin augering. Noggin augering is the action of drilling or boring a hole in a character's noggin. Please keep these terms in mind. They will become important later in the episode. So let's get into a film summary. In this film, it takes place on Halloween night. So on Halloween night, friends Morgan, Lori, Christina, and Jason leave work to visit a local haunted house. The haunted house that they're going to visit has been set up to mimic real crimes from local legends perpetrated by a series of crazed killers who are, who are pervert, who are incarcerated at the local state asylum. So it's in poor taste. Now, unknown to the patrons of the haunted house, the real killers have escaped from an asylum and are playing the roles of themselves in the haunt. Yes, it is a real haunt. Which leads us to our villain profile. Our villains for this film are a team. Annabel the Cannibal, the Taxidermist, Dollface, Dr. Suave, Mental Manny, and Rocco the Clown. And there you see their pictures in the Funhouse Massacre poster. These are a belong to the class of mentally deranged serial killers. As far as special powers go, uh, for the most part, these are run-of-the-mill serial killers. Rocco the Clown possesses tremendous strength. He's gigantic. Uh, Dollface is quite skilled with knives, but other than that, they're pretty much just run-of-the-mill serial killers. Signature weapon, they each have their own signature style. Animal the Cannibal uses kitchen implements, for example. Dr. Suave is an evil dentist who uses a drill. Doll Dollface prefers to use knives. The taxidermist prefers to use taxidermy tools and so on and so on and so on. Rocco the Clown just uses feats of strength. But that is our villain profile for this film. So let's talk about the things I liked about this film. Right off the bat, the body count is just tremendous. It's un uncountable is what I determined in trying to keep score on this film. I do have a body count, but it is just a gross estimate and does not account for many additional deaths that occur either off screen or in a mass casualty event. The body count in this film is just huge. The direction and the production values are above average for a horror feature. The practical special effects are pretty good. The kills are interesting and run a wide range of different styles. The film keeps the action moving and never sits still for too long. And finally, the cast is likable. I should say, at least the ones that are supposed to be likable are likable. As is the case with so many horror movies, you have some intentionally dislikable characters to make you feel good about seeing them get finished off. Now, this film is not without flaw. Let's talk about some of the things that could have been better. So right off the bat, the film is not particularly original in terms of the story. It's just not an original film. In addition to that, none of the killers are particularly original. They're all archetypes. Uh, Animal the Cannibal is based loosely upon Hannibal Lecter and so on and so on. None of these killers are something that you have not seen before. The attempts to weave a backstory into the film are more confusing than interesting. The acting is not bad, but it's nothing to write home about. And fi finally, everything about the film is just simply fine. There's nothing outstanding about it. There's nothing tremendous ab above, above average about this film. It's just uh, kind of run of the mill. 
Let's get to Steve's scorecard for this film. So right off the bat, we have kills. And this is just an estimate, but I counted 31 plus many more. The 31 does not count dead bodies who were killed off screen. The 31 does not include many that die in a mass casualty event towards the end of the film. 31 is just the number of straight up kills that I counted. The body count in this film, as I said, is just tremendous. Bare breasts. I counted one. Yeah, one, not two, just one. Dean Noggining. How many characters lose their melon in this film? Well, I counted one. In Fuego Inating. Again, I counted one. One character set ablaze in this film. Smoosh Noodling. I counted one. Noggin Augering. Our vocabulary term for this week. I counted one with more implied, but we get to see one straight up. Face peeling, we get one. And finally, mass casualty events. Towards the end of the film, it just goes haywire, and we have a mass casualty event. So we have one of those, contributing to the many more than 31 kills. But that is not all. With your viewing of the Funhouse Massacre, you also get some bonus features, such as a Robert England sighting. You get incompetent police work action. You get filthy restaurant action. It is kind of gross. You get human taxidermy action. You get cannibalism action. You get microphone eating action. I should say forced microphone eating action. It's not that the guy ate it on uh, of his own free will. You get bathroom fight action. And finally, you get kitchen fight action. So what's Steve's final score for this film? We're gonna give it two and a half paws out of four. We're gonna say this is a campy horror comedy with an explosive body count that manages to be above average on many fronts, including production values, but it just does not feel fresh or original. I just felt kind of underwhelmed by this film. It's good, but it just does not seem to be as good as it could have been. So that is the Funhouse Massacre. That is our featured film review for the evening. And now a word from our benevolent overlords at PBDC-TV, your nightly heartbeat of horror. Nuclear fire, unforgiving claims. I survived through the dust and ash. Came back in time to give you a chance. We have arrived at the end of yet another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. But before we go, as is our tradition, we're going to take just a couple of minutes to talk about some of the other stuff Steve watched this week. Starting with this film, this was called American Fright Fest. American Fright Fest is a 2018 American horror film that I found on Tubi, free with ads. In this film, a washed up horror director takes the job of directing a live action haunt attraction for Halloween. 
The haunt takes place, of course, inside the walls of an abandoned insane asylum. In the meantime, a busload of criminally insane mental patients has an accident and several escape. You can kind of see where this is going. A pair of survivors from the bus crash make their way to the haunted attraction and blend in with the cast. You can see where this is going, and yes, it does sound more than a little like the Funhouse Massacre. I did not do this on purpose, but I did end up reviewing two films that follow pretty much the same premise. So the pro for this film? Really not that much. To be honest, this film struggled to hold my interest. On the con side, everything about this film is subpar. The production values, the writing, the lighting, the acting, everything is subpar. There's really nothing to recommend this movie. I recommend that you avoid it. There are better slasher films available. Stay away from American Fright Fest. We also watched something else this week. We watched something called Final Girl Halloween. Final Girl Halloween is a 2024 American horror film that I found again on To Be Free With Ads. In this film, out at night with her friends, Erin is the sole survivor as a masked man kills six of her friends. So she's out with friends, they're attacked by a masked killer, Erin is the only survivor. Erin is racked with guilt over being the sole survivor, as you might imagine. But guilt transforms to terror as the masked killer returns and starts eliminating Aaron's classmates. Now, if you can't tell from the description already, let's lay it out for you. This is a whodunit style slasher film that is basically a low rent copy of Scream with inferior production values. Yes, it is very much like Scream. That said, the movie did manage to keep me interested until the very end. So on the pro side, the story is entertaining enough to keep your interest and to keep you guessing who the killer is. On the con side, you've got subpar direct-to-video production values to deal with. But overall, the verdict on this one is that it is a surprisingly tolerable film. You can do much worse. And finally, just to round out the feature of other stuff Steve watched this week, I watched a film called Aquarium of the Dead. Yes, Amazon Prime recommended this one to me, recommended it highly, or excuse me, not highly, recommended it heavily, I should say. It was in all my recommendation lists, first the list over and over again, so I finally broke down and watched it when I was away on a trip. I needed to kill some time, so I watched Aquarium of the Dead. Aquarium of the Dead is a 2021 American horror film that I found on Amazon Prime. This is an asylum film, the fine folks that brought us the Sharknado series. So you know what you're in for from the very beginning. You do not expect quality when you're doing an asylum film. The film, although, uh, is basically unwatchable. Even by asylum film standards, it's just basically unwatchable. It is just, uh, it, it's, it's hard to describe how unwatchable this film is. Basically, the creature effects are looks like some interns were paid to do some CGI critters in front of green screens and then other interns were paid to just kind of mesh those together with live action actors to make it look kind of like you've got critters and people in, interacting in the same place at the same time. Something that we do have experience here with on Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, but we don't command the budget that the Asylum commands. The movie lacks any of the charm of dumb asylum movies like Sharknado. It's just not any fun. So Amazon, why oh why do you recommend films like this for me? I don't understand. There are so many horror films out there that you could be recommending. Why do you recommend this one? I just don't get it. Amazon, I'm basically doing this review just so I can complain about your algorithms. Amazon, not impressed by the algorithms and what they came up with this time around. That is Aquarium of the Dead. Not worth your time. Stay away from Aquarium of the Dead. So those are the other stuff Steve watched this week. We've got American Freight Fest, Final Girl Halloween, and Aquarium of the Dead. Uh, of those films, Final Girl Halloween, only the only one really worth watching. 
The other two I recommend you stay away from, and that is Other Stuff Steve Watched This Week. That concludes another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Thank you so much for joining us. We're glad you were able to drop by. If you did enjoy the show, then please check us out on social media. You can find Steve the Cat on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or X, which is, I believe, what they're calling Twitter now. So please stop by and hit that subscribe button. Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat is available exclusively through the PBDC Collective Incorporated, now legally incorporated and still your heartbeat of horror. You can find us on the web at psychobunnydc.com, or you can check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, Twitter, Rumble, and Patreon. That wraps up the show for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again soon with another all-new episode for you to enjoy. But for now, thank you for watching. Have a great week. Good night, everybody.